Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Greg Duncan. I'm going to be your facilitator for uh, Everyday Counts for Pavement Preservation How. And so those of you who were with us for uh, Pavement Preservation When Where this morning, uh, we talked about really the, the processes and the, uh, the pavement management system and how we extract data out of that. Uh, how we use that data for cost-effective uh, calculations and those sorts of things. Uh, this session we're going to talk quite a bit about how we implement those treatments and doing those so that we achieve uh, defect-free construction and we learn about new techniques and uh, we're going to talk about the processes that uh, transportation owners go through as they're, as they're trying to develop specifications and deliver those projects. So, so we do have quite a bit of information uh, that we're going to try to utilize today as we go through presentations. So just as a matter of background, you have in front of you a participant workbook uh, that has uh, slides for today's presentations. It also has uh, slides from previous presentations that have been given on the subject. Uh, there have been three previous in-person summits across the United States and, and three more follow this one. So this is sort of the, the top of the summit. Uh, the, um, you also have an evaluation form for the session just to give us some feedback on how well we did covering the material. Uh, one of the things in there that's uh, important to me as one of the folks who has to uh, come away from these summits and write an implementation plan, there's a worksheet in there where we ask you some specific questions and we'd like for you to provide some feedback and, and speak into that process of how do we take this topic and implement it across the country. What are the, what are the steps that are needed? What are the tools that you need to do that? Who are the stakeholders that we need to, to talk to. So I'm glad that we have a really diverse uh, crowd here with uh, construction, materials, maintenance, uh, federal partners, local partners, lots of folks uh, here that can, that can speak to this. So our goal is to really make this an interactive uh, day. We have uh, several presentations lined up for you. Uh, to provide you some information and background on what the topic really is. Um, and so we're, we're preparing you to provide feedback at the end of the session. So please stay engaged and uh, we'll, have a, we'll have a good afternoon meeting. So our first topic, have I forgotten to do anything before, before I move on? Um, our first speaker is James Gray with the Federal Highway Administration, and again, he's going to provide sort of the overview of our, of our uh, EDC4 topic and the background of why we're, why we're here today. So, James, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Is my phone on? Working? Everybody hear me fine? All right, so we're here for the pavement preservation. How, as Greg said, this is where we're talking about the construction practices, materials, making sure that once we've selected the right road, the right time, with the right treatment, we get the good quality construction, the right material, so that the product is what we anticipated it to be. This is the Federal Highway Team. Um, feel free to reach out to us at any point in time. Our goal is to work with the states, locals, federal land management agencies, we want to work together to put together the implementation plan that works for you. Uh, we don't know what you need unless you tell us. We don't want to make assumptions about um, trying to solve problems and trying to knock down barriers and then find out that those barriers don't exist or were the wrong barriers. We need to know where, what those barriers are and how we can help collaboratively um, move past them. So feel free to reach out to any of these people on the slide. My contact information is right up there. Uh, email, call me, uh, I'll leave the slide up here for a little bit longer. If you want to talk to me after the session, I'll stick around and you can talk to me then as well. So quickly what I'm going to go over is what is Pravement Preservation How? Where did it come from? Uh, what can you expect the next two years to look like? What tools are already under development? 
and where you might want to look for additional information. So first, pavement preservation globally is the right treatment, the right time, on the right pavement with quality construction materials and practices. The construction and materials like talked about is, is the how part that we're focused on right now in this session. So where did it come from? Why are we at where we're at? Uh, briefly, you look in, you can see on the x-axis here is years. The y-axis on this side is the millions of Lane, uh, center lane miles of interstate, and then this is uh, the trillions of vehicle miles traveled. Uh, as you can see, in about 1950, there was a, a large increase in building out the interstate system until about 1980, and then it kind of stopped. The vehicle miles traveled, though, did not stop. That continued an exponential increase. About 1980 is when things switched to building out the interstate system from connecting to building out capacity projects. You can see that has moved forward uh, fairly well, but if you look at it in terms of capacity, the interstate system is only adding less than half a percent of new capacity every year. So just from a fundamental understanding, we are by default in a preservation mode. We're not adding substantial new capacity to our road networks. We are trying to preserve what exists. Another way to look at it is economically, what this represents, depending on your economic model, is about a $5 trillion investment. If we just let it all go and decided we would just wait until it all fails and we'll rebuild from scratch, it's about $5 trillion, not including design costs, not including user delay costs, things that we know we'd have to account for, construction oversight costs, the, the raw construction costs. So letting it all go is, is not financially viable, nor would it be prudent even if we had those levels of funding. So we're trying to preserve what we have. What well, we've heard back from outreach to the states um, when we look together to put this round of EDC initiatives together is what's market ready, what's out there available today that can be used to help preserve our pavements in a state of good repair. And for flexible surface treatments, we've come up with chip seal, microsurfacing, slurry seals, scrub seals, and ultra-thin uh, bonded wearing courses. And on the rigid pavement preservation, we have partial depth repair, full depth repair, dowel bar retrofit cross-stitching, and diamond grinding. And you may be thinking, well, we do some of these things already, or we do a lot of these, or we do a lot of these well. Um, there's some states that do none of these, some states that do all of these, and some states are in between. If you do all of these, and you do all of them extremely well, you have a very high rate of success, we want to hear from you, we want to hear your experiences, what you've done that's made it all of these uh, so successful, or each individual one successful within your state. Or if you've had challenges, we want to understand what those challenges are, and what you think would be the best way to help uh, mitigate those challenges, information, peer exchanges, webinars, training, those types of things. So what can you expect from EDC4 for going forward? It's a little bit what I've been talking about. It's one of 11 technologies. You've seen the, the rooms, breakout sessions with uh, the other 10. Um, hopefully you can get to some of the other ones as well. Uh, this will be, like I said, four out of seven summits where we're trying to get feedback from all of the states, all locals, um, industry, we want a broad cross-section of information provided back. And those are the presentations we're giving as well. You'll hear an owner perspective and an industry perspective. You'll hear a flexible perspective and a rigid perspective. Uh, so make sure we're trying to maintain balance as we move forward with our implementation plan. With When we wrap up all these summits and we gain uh, as much knowledge as we can get from everyone and get all the feedback put together, we'll have an implementation plan on how we're going to help all the states, locals, pull all this together and move forward uh, collaboratively. And that's what we'll work on for 2017, 2018, put those peer exchanges together, webinars, trainings, whatever we identify as, as most useful. And uh, So with that said, there are some tools that are already under development and will hopefully be ready to deploy shortly. Um, we're putting together best practice guides for uh, flexible surfaces, that's uh, being spearheaded by Nevada DOT, uh, and rigid surfaces being spearheaded by Missouri DOT. We have web-based training for rigid surface pavement preservation, and it's currently under contract and under development. Hopefully that'll be out within the next six months to a year. Uh, 
There's web-based training for flexible surface pavement preservation. That is complete. There's the link there. You can go take that training at any time to uh, look at some of the best practices for constructing flexible surface pavement preservation treatments. We also are working on a research project to look at incorporating RAP in uh, pavement preservation, preservation treatments. That's ongoing. It's an 18-month research uh, project, so that'll come to conclusion towards the end of our implementation plan, but hopefully we'll be able to get some information from that into our final work product. All that, this is our implementation team. As you can see, it's a broad cross-section of the industry, state, local, uh, industry, federal highway. Feel free, if there's someone on this table you're more comfortable reaching out to, reach out to anyone. They're, they know their name is on this table. They know that they're being presented as someone they can be, that can be contacted. Again, if we just want to hear back what we can do to help move pavement preservation forward. That being said, we're compiling all of the information and all of our efforts will be on one of these two websites, if not both. Um, so please check in on these websites regularly as we complete something. If there's a peer exchange held and you're not able to attend, minutes, things of that nature will be posted on uh, one or both of these websites. Training is already uh, posted on the preservation site. Should have the, uh, the uh, flexible training is already up there. Um, so with that, I will turn things back over to Greg, who will move forward with the next presentation. All right. So our next presenter is a uh, colleague of mine. Uh, I didn't uh, fully introduce myself. I'm, I'm with Applied Pavement Technology, uh, have been for about the last 18 months, but I began my, my engineering career with a Tennessee DOT. So living in Spokane, Washington, I have to tell folks I live in Spokane, but that's not where I learned to talk. So uh, it's my pleasure to get to introduce someone who I fully understand the way they talk. Uh, Mr. Scott Capps is the state road maintenance engineer from the North Carolina DOT, and he has a presentation for us on their best practices using chip seals. So, Scott. Thank you, Greg. Um, a couple of years ago, I reckon we were at, uh, I don't know, a Snow and Ice Conference, Bozeman, Montana. I did a presentation, and I told everybody they, they needed to listen slower. And if, uh, <laughs> if at the end of it they didn't understand, they could talk to Greg, and he would interpret everything for me. I, I am proud to be from North Carolina. I do have the Southern North Carolina draw. Um, does not mean I'm uneducated. Uh, <clears throat> but, but I will say that... that uh, you know, while I got PE and certified equipment manager and all that behind my name, I'm just a North Carolina farm board that was really good in math. Uh, prior to uh, going to college and, and embarking on a career in civil engineering, I actually was a temporary highway maintenance worker for the North Carolina uh, DOT. So I've done everything from pick up dead dogs to, to actually chip seal operations. I've been operating a tandem dump truck going 25 miles an hour down the road backwards. Uh, at the time, I didn't know all. I, all the job was was go go here, pick up rock, go there, hook up to the spreader, and go. You know, that's all I knew about pavement preser preservation. Uh, over the years, I've learned a little bit more. I don't know what quantifies as a subject matter matter expert, but uh, but I'll give you a brief preview of uh, of what North Carolina does and and some of the best practices we have implemented. I'm going to start out a little bit with we did the uh, when and where this morning. I'm going to do the why. Um, North Carolina, all the blue is everything under 5,000 ADT in North Carolina. Uh, the red is, is greater than 5,000 ADT. Approximately 60,000 miles of secondary paved system. Do it here. 54% um, of them have plant mix and 44% have a chip seal. Bottom line, we got to have chip seal as a tool in our toolbox. We can't put hot mix on, on 80,000 miles of a system. Um, 80,000 is what we maintain uh, center line miles second to, to Texas. There is no county system in North Carolina. It's either state maintained, municipal, or private. Um, so that's why we, 
we maintain all those miles. Um, we, we've done, we did a lot of cost comparisons. Uh, we did most of our chip seal work in-house. We just recently started doing contracting, and I'll get to that in a minute. But right now, our costs are about $25,000 a mile for a chip seal compared to approximately 100000 um, a lane mile for plant mix. I, I was looking at Washington's numbers earlier. They're a little different. Bottom line, it's about a one-to-four ratio on, on plant mix versus, versus chip seal. So how do you get a best practice uh, to ensure a great chip seal. Number one we talked about a little bit this morning was dedicated funding. You've got to have a funding stream. You can't really do it with maintenance dollars. You can't pull aside um, some reserves and dollars. In North Carolina, the Asphalt Payment Association, they, that's their money. They want to put down hot mix. And, um, and so we did have some dedicated funding for chip seal uh, from our legislature. But then the the contractors that was still their money so now we've started uh contracting a majority of our chip seal work out so you've got to have a dedicated funding stream uh and what i'm primarily going to focus on today is the equipment materials and the training that you need to do to have have a good best practice chip seal um going over throughout the years uh, we started in 1999, and I really am not the subject matter expert. For those people who know Emily McGraw, she works for me in the state maintenance uh, unit. And she was a young girl that had a master's degree in pavement from North Carolina State, and her task was to start North Carolina's preservation program. So that meant we have 14 different divisions. So that meant bringing 14 old people uh, <laughs> that had been doing this for years the way they did it and bringing them together and start exchanging ideas, doing things the right way. And so this young girl embarked on that and accomplished great things to where these, these 14 old men who had done it their way for 25, 30, 40 years embraced her, took her in as the, as the queen of payment preservation. And so she did a wonderful job in growing our preservation program. I was in the field when we initially started this, if you look at 99, and we were a worse first state. Um, we got our resurfacing and dollars. Uh, we started at, at a pavement grade of 70, and you, you put hot mix on everything that meant, meant it was 70, and when your hot mix money ran out, you resurfaced or retreated with a chip seal the roads that were worse than that. The worst thing you can do as far as, as spending your dollars. So we were a worse first state. Um, like Katie talked about this morning, if you're going to wait till you get those roads ready before you start a preservation program, you're never going to get there. you you, you got to start in your 75s and 80s on your pavement condition survey and go ahead and keep in good roads good. you just got to make that break and start doing it. Um, our funding has gone up and down. That You know, there were some market crises in, in uh, 05 and 2009. Um, and then at 11, when the bridge fell, when was Minnesota, Michigan, Minnesota? So all our pavement preservation money went to bridge preservation. We got to do something with our bridges, you know. So we, uh, we hardly did anything in, in uh, 2013. And then in 2013, we also switched over from being uh, almost 100% in-house. The legislature said within five years, you will be 80% outsourced. So that made us rethink what we were doing. Uh, we had the legislation also said you will grow this industry in North Carolina. So we developed some training modules and some training programs and train uh, contractors. And those things are available on our website uh, as far as best practices go. This, this was a hard pill to swallow. We felt like North Carolina was very good in, in our chip seal program. We had, we had brought those 14 old men together and come up with a, with a program that everybody kind of embraced and that we would try new things and do different things and, and be innovative in what we were doing. And a lot of it was through research. Um, so introduction to chip seals. Keep good roads good. It's also known as road oil, tar and gravel, bituminous surface treatment, asphalt surface treatment, chip seal. Um, and basically, it's a layer of emulsion followed by a layer of aggregate. At the end of the day, it is tar and gravel. Uh, now, in some states, that's 
man, this archaic. We've had people in North Carolina, why are you putting this archaic, you know, surface on our road? Um, so we've had to learn through that. Uh, from Washington, they were talking this morning, you can do a chip seal and do a fog seal right over top of it or a soy seal, and it'll look, it'll look almost and ride just like hot mix. So there's things that can be done uh, to make it a good tool in a toolbox at one-fourth of the cost. The main thing to start out with on, on developing a best practice is, is your equipment. You've got aggregate spreaders, distributors, rubber tire or combo rollers, and a broom or vacuum. Um, and the primary key to success is calibration. For your distributor, the height of the spray bar, uh, for single, double, and triple coverage, cut off one or two nozzles so that the tip do, do not touch, and a uniform spray, and you always got to have new, clean nozzles. When we first started out, the, the crews would go out there and just go at it. If the nozzle was stopped up, then you ride out there, you know, three months later and you got a streak, you know, where the aggregate didn't stick. And nobody cared. We didn't have a QA or QC type program on that. So we developed all that. So if you're just embarking on this, you got to have people that care about the equipment. You got to make sure that the nozzles are clean, that they're new, that you're getting a good spray, that you practice that. At the beginning of every season, most crew, most crews would go out and do a, a, a parking lot that needed done, you know, a state-owned parking lot. And so we would practice our calibration and get everything straight uh, before we hit the road. So a primary key to success is calibration for the distributor and also for the spreader. You want to know exactly how much stone you're putting down. Uh, you want a uniform coverage, and then you want operating speed. When you're... When you're riding, and, and I know this from both sides of it, being the engineer looking at it after the fact and being the guy in the truck behind it, if you're riding down the road going about 30 miles an hour and you hit a bump, you're about to put a washboard in your road for the next ever so long. So operating speed is, is key. Uh, having an operator that's, that's good and knows what he's doing is key. Um, one of the main things we did through, through a lot of research that we did in North Carolina, we did nine different research projects uh, with North Carolina State University on our chip seal program. One of the main things we learned was a single size clean washed stone. That provided the best seal you could get. We primarily used a granite material, uh, which is our 78M, or a lightweight um, baked slate. The other, the other thing that we looked at were our emulsions. We used a CRS too, but then we found that the polymer modified or the latex modified provided a better bonding. As one of them old guys said, it's got more stickum in it. Yeah, so they could care less. They don't know what the P mean or the L mean, but it's got more stickum in it. And so uh, we were able to sell our supervisors on, on this type of, of stuff. And then when they finally saw that the single size stone work, like I said, we went to the quarry, you bought a five eighths if you were doing a matte and seal, um, and it really didn't, it had a lot of fines in it. We weren't getting a very good product. Uh, and so we grew our program over, over the years through clean wash, single size stone, and the use of polymer modified and latex modified emulsions. Um, this is just a picture showing the, the uh, slate, which is a very dark <coughs> color going down and then the granite is a very light color going down. We could put the lightweight aggregate down on a lot of roads and nobody would ever know that it wasn't hot mix. Uh, it, it looked that dark and looked like it. Um, <clears throat> the main thing about your aggregate is know your rock. Um, we, we do a lot, we do all of our specifications, we do a lot, all of our tests and everything with our materials and test unit. I think I heard some materials and test uh, people in the room here. Um, it takes coordination with quarries. You can, you can spec whatever size rock you want, but if the quarry's not going to make it, you're, you're not going to have anything to work with. So you need to co uh, coordinate with your quarries to know, all right, if we're going to wash this stone three times or if we're going to grade it one more time to get it down to a single size, you know, what, what cost factor is that going to be? What are they, are they going to do it? Are they willing to to invest in that for that product. Um, and so coordination with your materials and test groups, your cores, um, the shape, we've talked about that, flat tends to bleed. 
hardness, we use granite or slate. I'm, I had limestone in here, and somebody in one of the, uh, when we did it online, said, well, does, it, does limestone not work? No, limestone will work. Um, it's just you might want to look at, at the weight of your roller uh, and when, you're, when you're putting it down because it will crush it. I would go with a, a, either a lighter weight steel wheel or a rubber tire, and we'll get to rolling pounders in a minute. So, yeah, limestone will work, but you do want to look at hardness. One of the main things is cleanliness. Um, you want minimum fines. Dust tends to bleed and ravel. And then uniform size. Keep the stockpiles clean and dry. Keep the aggregate separated. Uh, if, you, if you get up every rock out of your stockpile, you're going to have a mess on that last part of your road. It's just not going to work. Just wherever your stockpile is, just take a grater in there after the fact and grate it out, and wherever you put it, it had a nice, nice little layer of gravel on it for the next time. Do not get it down to the to the base material. Um, the other thing we worked with was the emulsions, and like I said before, we use latex modified or poly from, poly, polymer modified. Um, it's proven reduction in the reduction of loose aggregate uh, has a positive charge, but you do not mix the emulsions. We we've, we've had people do that too. You just go back, and put ever what's in the distributor. That will not work. You'll have aggregate <coughs> loss after the fact. And then the application temperature, this is key to, is 160 to 170. So know, know the dynamics of, of the material you're using and the specifications. Um, like I said before, we were totally in-house operation, and, um, and we have specifications for that. And we call it the art and the science of chip seal. It is an art. Now, you can put science to it, uh, but it is, it is an art. And so we had ranges uh, for when we would, for our rates. When we went to outsourcing and go to contract, we just had a target. And so we've got a, here's a target, but if you're within, it's still a range, we just called it different. And so here's, here's what our specifications are now um, as far as the, the amount of um, emulsion and amount of aggregate that are going down on, within the layers. Um, the other thing that to consider is the weather conditions, uh, kind of like Goldilocks and the Three Bears, it needs to be just right. Now, it's never just right. That's why we call it the art. Uh, too much water has a tendency to bleed. Too little water has a tendency to ravel. Little water is just right. The temperature, extremely high temperatures have a tendency to bleed. Extremely low temperatures have the tendency to ravel. Between 70 and 80 degrees is just right. How many people have ever been to North Carolina in July? All right. It is not between 70 and 80 degrees, and it is not just right. The weather forecast is the exact same every day. Hot and humid, Ralph, back to you. You know, so it, um, so that's why you have to adjust those rates. You, you, the, the supervisor has to know what's going on out there as far as weather conditions. It changes during the day uh, as far as, as you starting out in the morning at, at 7.30 and ending that night at 6 o'clock, um, it's going to get real hot and humid in North Carolina in July and August, uh, which is the prime of our pavement season. So though we, in our contracts now, we do not place AST from October 15th to April 1st. Um, and we put that in the contract. In eastern North Carolina, you could push, push putting it down uh, uh, past October. It doesn't get too cold there. But those were our weather, um, our weather considerations. The other things we put into the contract are 12 months chip seal warranty, uh, performance and payment bond. We look at loss of aggregate. We look, look at bleeding. And then we look at small distresses over the lot of a 200-foot length. The other thing that we've tried to, to work with our contract industry on and also our own, our own in-house forces, we were doing it, was we had one supervisor, he would come out there and he'd say, it's a mirror image. And so when I was a county maintenance engineer, the bituminous unit would come in and, and prep and resurface the roads. The same prep is required for chip seal as it is required for hot mix. I mean, and a, actually more prep. Chip seal will not work on rutting. If you've got rutting, you need to go ahead and level that out. You need to seal your cracks. You need to sweep it prior to all that. So it, you know, you got to have the same amount of prep, if not more, 
than if you're doing a doing a hot mix because it is a mirror image. I mean, if you've got redding uh, when you start it, you're going to have redding when you finish. A chip seal is not going to going to fix rutting. It will seal small cracks, but it will not seal big cracks. It will for about a, six months or a year, then you'll see the same crack coming back through. So there's a lot of prep uh, for the road that needs to go in with a chip seal also. But like I said before, with the 80,000 mile system, 60,000 miles of secondary road, and the majority of that under 5,080T, uh, it's a tool in our toolbox that we have to have. Our goal is to touch about 10% of our system a year and through crack sealing, through um, hot mix resurfacing, through chip seals, through other, other methods. That chip seal is not the only payment preservation tool we use, but it's the primary one uh, for our system. But those are the, that's kind of the growth of the program we had. Uh, and like I said, we, we did have a, a lot of research projects that we did with North Carolina State. Um, we had a lot of trial and error with our supervisors across the whole state. And um, and different areas act a little different. Different rock in different areas act a little different. Uh, the cores you have uh, in each area. But we feel like we had a, we have a great program. Now we're transitioning that program over to the contracting industry. Uh, by 2018, we'll be 80% uh, or almost 100% contracted out versus 100% in-house. Um, with that, that completes my presentation. Any questions? The, the question is, on 44% of our roads have a chip seal treatment. I'm going to say... About half is is original chip seal on base, and half is what Washington talked about this morning, going back from a hot mix to a to a chip seal. Um, just rough numbers, but we in we had 70, 80,000 miles of unpaved roads. That, not 80,000. Not close. We had a lot of unpaved roads at one time. Uh, with that, we just did eight inches of stone and a chip seal base. I mean, a chip seal top, and that's what a lot of our roads still are. So I noticed you have a, a one-year warranty on your chip seals. Mm -hmm. And so under, you have there on the screen the, the target <coughs> shot rate and, and spread rate. Does the contractor make the adjustment, necessary adjustments to that and then is responsible through them, for them through the warranty? Or is the agency responsible for adjusting those? Great question. Yeah. We're, we're in the middle of that, well, too. Yeah. And we're in the middle of, we just started really contracting this out and putting this last year, so the one-year warranty is, is, is coming up now. Uh, one thing we also had to do in-house was train our construction inspectors on chip seal operations. They, they had never done it. it we had always done it in-house. And so our in-house forces, and we had our own QAQC internally, but then we had to go out and, and train construction inspectors to, to on, on how to inspect these contracts. The contractor is responsible for it. He makes the adjustments on the fly. We document it, but we haven't tried to get any warranty money back yet, so we'll see how that goes. Along those lines in that thought process for a warranty, if you're not in the Goldilocks zone, mm -hmm. um, I would presume that the contractor is monitoring the Goldilocks zone and your inspector is not saying keep going. Is that fair? Or? That is fair. And then secondary to that, I know in, in Oregon we've had issues where we've had chip seals go past, uh, I'll say truck stop areas or what have you, where there's big turning moments and we mm -hmm. rip it right off the highway within a few days of the chip seal. So does the contractor have that allowance too if you are in a high turning movement with truck traffic or? Have we haven't had that case uh, come up. Um, so we, ha we really haven't gotten, gotten into, the, into the warranty uh, reviews and adjustments uh, yet. Any further questions? Well, once again, we, we have some of this information online at ncdot.gov. Um, 
I would go ahead and give it to you, but they change our website every other day. So just go to ncdot.gov and type in preservation, you might get it. And um, but um, anyway, thank you for your attention. Thank you for the questions. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Scott. Scott's one of my old neighbors. Uh, when I was with the Tennessee DOT, uh, I used to talk to uh, Jennifer Brandenburg, uh, the state maintenance engineer over there. Pretty regularly, we shared a stretch of I-40 and uh, shared several rock slides along the way. So we were all the time shutting down roads between our states. It was sort of anti-commerce, uh, if I can if I can joke about that a little bit. But it, it uh, seemed like every spring we had something. I think one maintenance conference we went to, there, there are like five main roads that connect Tennessee and North Carolina, and three of them were shut down at the time. Uh, so we had a, had a really wet spring. Uh, so from uh, getting to introduce one of my neighbors from North Carolina, I now get to introduce a neighbor from Spokane. Uh, Robert Segetti represents uh, Acme Concrete Paving Company. He's a vice president there, lives in Spokane, operates out of that, that area. So he's one of my new neighbors. I look forward to, to getting to know uh, Robert more. Uh, but we... We look forward to his presentation on uh, concrete pavement preservation practices and the, 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 the new technologies and new things that, um, as an industry, they, they do a lot of good things for, uh, for training and bringing those new practices uh, to bear. So, uh, Robert Segetti, thank you. Uh, yeah, quick here. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, concrete pavement preservation kind of got into this uh, back in 1985 when I graduated from college. I went to work for Acme Concrete at that time. And uh, one of my first jobs was a concrete rehab project in Kellogg, Idaho. Uh, spent a full year there uh, doing spall repair, panel replacement, diamond grinding, um, new shoulders, that kind of thing. And from there, I stayed with Acme Concrete and uh, we do concrete paving and, and now do the diamond grinding and all the panel replacements in-house along with the Dalbar retrofit. Um, you would have got to listen to uh, uh, John Roberts from the IGGA from New York. So probably a little bit more stories, and, but uh, it got me to fill his place. He's in his annual meeting. But uh, concrete pavement preservation got started uh, with concrete grinding. Uh, back in the early 60s as a preservation method. And uh, as you can see, the old grinders there, if there's three of them there, we have model number four uh, sitting in our yard still. Um, and uh, things have changed quite a bit from this period of time. Uh, the things we're going to talk about today are the cross-stitching, dowel bar retrofit, partial depth repair, uh, full depth repair and diamond grinding. There's other topics we could talk about like sub seal and joint and crack sealing, but we'll just stick with these five today. Um, on the cross stitching, um, use this for longitudinal joints or particularly longitudinal cracks uh, that occur. We've also put them in diagonal cracks on some concrete pavements uh, that they've occurred on rehab projects. Um, it helps maintain the aggregate interlock that is uh, existing there. It also helps if you have a joint that during the concrete paving process a tie bar was missed and those slabs start to move apart, you can restitch them together and stop that mitigation uh, from happening um, and the lane separation. Uh, it also helps prevent the longitudinal cracks from faulting and maintains that uh, load transfer across those cracks. Here's a typical joint view, um, and it's very simple. You drill a bar at a 35 to 45 degree angle. If you go to the IGGA website or ACPA or the National Concrete uh, Center for Technology, they'll have some tables for concrete thickness, what size bar you should use. Um, and the, the largest bar that I've seen used is a three-quarter, typically we're with a number five bar. Uh, 
simply drill a hole at 24 to 36 inches depending on the pavement thickness and how much you want to lock that baby up and go from there. We've set up drills up there in the picture on the left uh, in order to drill at the proper angle. Uh, one of the things that we have noticed if you lose too large of a drill you'll start to pop that surface off at the crack interface. Um, also notice that sometimes that drill needs to be able to drill down for a little bit before going to the angle and that helps create a better hole for the uh, rebar to go in. Poxy inject it, drive the bar in it. Uh, it's nice to keep those bars slightly recessed uh, so that when you go through with the diamond grinders you're not cutting steel with your machines. Because a lot of times you end up with a joint like you saw on the previous slide that is so straight uh, it almost looks like a saw cut. Uh, those bars will end up at the same location on the grinder head and you'll burn up that that head and have to restack <laughs> and you'll also see it over time in the concrete grinding. Um, partial depth repair, small repair um, is what I call it because it's kind of come up but you use that on joints and inside panels uh, if you had a deteriorated section in areas that the, the spall goes down one-third of the slab thickness. Helps restore the ride quality on the pavement. Um, also, it's a minimal interruption to traffic. You do have to do a lane closure to get out there. And it costs way less than doing uh, full depth panel for a simple spall repair. With the new materials that have come out, spall repairs is a much better technique. Uh, back in 1985, we used a kind of proprietary 9 sack mix that we developed and had sacked for us for these 4,000 square feet of spalls that we did. But now you can go out on the market and there's lots of products out there that you could use. Uh, we prefer to use Rapid Set, the DOT mix. Uh, we find it to be very stable. We can either speed it up with hot water, we can slow it down with some acid, and uh, works very well. Uh, Minnesota DOT. You know, when we talk about technologies, this has been used for 20 years in their area, but it's never been really used in the West that we've seen. Uh, but using a cold mill to do the spall repair and to actually create the cavity for the material. Um, much faster than the saw cut and jackhammering with labor uh, and then refill. Uh, since it's a bonded type of operation, you don't have to have you know, nice even corners or square. It You can just cut it along and fill and bond. Uh, this has been working for over 20 years in Minnesota. The uh, patching material, we talked about that just a little bit. Um, there's the new cementaceous types like the Rapid Set and Foz Rocks and several others uh, that you can use to really speed up the process. But there's also uh, non-cement base type materials, polymer resins and elastomeric concretes. Uh, we've used a little bit of the elastomerics on some small repairs for some FAA work. Uh, we haven't used anything in the west uh, on, on city streets or highways. The cost differential between the two products is substantial, but one thing about it, you're not using a lot of material uh, for the small repair. The, these patches are 12 years old and with the elastomerics you don't have to reconstruct the joint or the crack. Um, that is typically one of the major failures you see in spall repairs that you go back to over the years where the guys didn't get it all the way down to the existing joint line or follow the crack uh, with their you know, foam fill or cardboard or whatever you use to recreate that joint. Uh, so this is a real uh, nice option. And you can see it's worn very well because those are right in the wheel paths. You have the tining up next to the longitudinal joint. It's wore down on the wheel path and then back to tining. Dalbar retrofit. Um, use Dalbar retrofits to recreate load transfer across transverse joints or transverse cracks. And just reestablishes that load transfer across those, across those joints. Particularly if you have a pavement that's uh, some of the work that we've done in Idaho, they did grinding without the retrofit, the faulting came back very quickly uh, because of the pumping action of the pavement slabs. Uh, where you put the Dalbar retrofit, it really holds 
those joints together and keeps the pumping action from happening and at future faulting so it allows the grinding to work a lot better. Since 1992, WashDOT's done about 650,000 bars. Um, I think we've been fortunate to do about 200,000 of those. And it's been pavements that have been an average of 32 years old. Um, some of that works up on I-90, other stuff down on 84, 82, um, a little bit of work on 95 south of Spokane. And all those pavements are very old and still functioning. Full depth panel repair. The uh, full depth panel repair is when you have a structurally deficient slab, multiple cracks, can't do a stitch, can't do a spall repair, and make those functional again. So helps restore the ride quality. Once again, you're using a fast setting mixes, uh, so we can do several panel replacements in an evening in a four to six hour shift. Uh, typical work times in the Seattle area, I-5, start at 11, have it open by 5. Figure an hour traffic control on each side of it. So you can get about, we can get about eight panels done. Um, the lifting techniques has changed over time with the pin and, and drop method where we can lift those panels out without disturbing the sub base. Um, that saves a lot of time in the field in re-prepping that base. One of the things that uh, I think would be helpful, since these panels were cracked, a lot of the time there is subsurface failure, but you don't have the time to get into those. And going over past projects, we see those panels re-cracking. So I think a light rebar mat, nothing, you know, nothing heavy, you know, number five is on a one-foot center or something, you can just drop into place and pour. If those panels do crack again, they'll just be held tightly together without having to think about coming back and stitching or doing something low cost and, and quick. As far as doing the process, get out there a couple days ahead of time. We do the full depth saw cuts. Sometimes we do a perimeter relief cut, then pull those panels out. Um, and we've been using, uh, once again, you know, like a four by four mix if you have a little bit more time or a rapid set concrete. Diamond grinding. Um, in the last few years, we've gotten into diamond grinding fairly heavily. And basically, we're removing you know, a thin layer of the top surface of the concrete. Um, sometimes it's quarter inch, sometimes it's 3 eighths. In our case, uh, in Washington, we have lots of rutting. So a lot of our jobs are we're removing a half inch to up to an inch, inch and a quarter to flatten those lanes out again to get the hydroplaning issues to go away. Um, so it's doable to get those pavements nice and flat. Um, get some surface smoothness back. Um, some of the work we did this year at IRIs in the 230s, uh, it was rutted pavement, so we did have to grind it three times, I believe. Our final IRI numbers were mid-30s, and uh, very flat, very smooth. The uh, diamond grinding provides type of corduroy texture, and you can change that texture depending on your blade spacing and if you want to go to like a next generation grind, which is the quietest pavement out there. Uh, also increases your skid resistance. And uh, typically you do it after you've done all your other pavement preservation techniques that we just talked about. Um, the grinding is typically thought of being used only on concrete pavement. However, there are um, a lot of states right now that are also using it on asphalt. Uh, we've done two projects in Washington for a contractor, an asphalt contractor that had a problem several lane miles that, where, we, uh, <clears throat> where we ground full width, full length, and restored the profile. Uh, that pavement seems to be, I wish it was kind of under a little bit of a study, so that way we can see how the surface texture and the skid and those type of numbers w are holding up in our area. Um, it's much less expensive than doing overlays on either concrete or the asphalt. Um, once again, surface friction and safety has increased. We can do it off peak hours. Um, 
we do not encroach into an additional lane, but we do need part of that lane to get right up to the longitudinal joint. Um, we don't change the clearances for your structures, so that's helpful. And it does blend all the surfaces together. And it is environmentally friendly uh, product. Um, and we've talked about these. It handles, you know, problems with the pavement of joint faulting at joints and cracks. Um, it, uh, you know, makes the road smooth to either new or better than new quality. Um, it, causes, it increases the friction of the roadway, so it takes care of your polished surfaces, takes care of warp slabs, uh, inadequate transverse slope. We can change the slope going across the roadway if you have something that's under your 2% or whatever your design standard is. And it produces an acceptable noise uh, surface. Here's some information from Missouri DOT uh, where they ground uh, I-70 uh, on their asphalt roadways. And then Wisconsin Marquette has done 40% or has done a study and they found that accidents decreased by 40% uh, with diamond ground surface uh, over the last six years. And in wet conditions, it's 57% less. Um, some other states that are doing that are uh, Maryland, North Carolina, New York, uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio. Um, we haven't seen much out, out west. As far as the blade spacing goes, um, you can change that blade spacing to change for your noise or friction or smoothness. Um, next generation grinding that we talked about is typically for a noise and skid. Uh, it's a three-step process. You grind the roadway as normal, come back through with a tighter spaced diamond head polish the roadway, and then you come back a third time and you groove it. Oftentimes, depending on the aggregates you're in, you can take the second and third step and combine those uh, with your diamond head. Um, the graph here, you can see that uh, just standard diamond grinding is the quietest grinding on concrete pavement as far as surface textures you'll typically see from the diamond grinding to burlap drag, longitudinal tine, and the noisiest is a transverse tiny. Kentucky, over uh, from 2000 to 7, 2012, they had a five-year program to grind all 536 miles of their PCC interstate. And they were able to reduce their IRI from 112 to 74. And supposedly this is the lowest recorded 536 miles of PCC on the IRI as far as an average goes. Cost them $188,000 per mile, or about $2.75 a square yard over that five-year period. Now, I'm assuming that at $2.75, they were disposing the slurry in the ditch, and they were also uh, probably in a limestone material versus some of the aggregates you'll be dealing with in the Northwest and elsewhere, because we have, do have some very hard aggregates here. They estimated that reconstruction of that would be 1.5 to 2.5 million per mile, and they saved about a billion dollars. So kind of in summary, uh, we're all trying to stretch the dollar, so it's, you know, everybody has their, um, their issues to work with through transportation here. And uh, I think the solutions that we've been using over time with the new materials provide a good cost-effective, sustainable solution to move forward with some of the concrete pavement preservation techniques that we've seen. And uh, IGGA and ACPA are more than willing to help out if you have any questions along with Federal Highways. And there's a few websites here on the back that hopefully we've all made it through. Any questions? Would you repeat the uh, thickness that you actually ground some of the concrete pavements? You inch or more? Yeah, inch to the deepest section that we ground was about an inch and a half in Spokane. Uh, last year we did a, a job in, uh, on I-80 in Truckee, California, um, which had a, an existing asphalt overlay <laughs> because the rutting was so bad. It pretty much took an inch off the entire roadway.
On the concrete piece, is that a function of the quality of the concrete or studded tires or both or what? Uh, here in Washington, it's primarily studded tires. Um, in Spokane, the ruts were about eight inches wide, SUV width apart, and uh, it was very difficult to, to get that rutting out. Up on Truckee, it was chains, and they do have much softer aggregate there, more of a cupped type rut. <coughs> Any other questions? Well, thank you. Okay, for the next few minutes, we're going to try to go through uh, a little bit of the interactive portion of the, the presentation here. I'm going to sit this here. If maybe Katie will walk it around. So. As you hear about the, the processes that are being championed here, the building the best practices in a chip seal program or the, the new technologies, the techniques that are available in a, in a rigid pavement preservation program, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to present a, a case for what is the state of the practice? What are we doing currently that maybe uh, all the state DOTs, all the transportation system owners are not aware of. And that's, that's really what we, what we want to try to get to the heart of is, are you aware of all these? Are you doing an exceptional job at all of them? Sort of like James said at the beginning, are you, are you a champion for all these techniques and do them really, really well? Or are there some that you're not so aware of where they work? What, what, you know, how do they work in snowplow areas? How do they work with studded tires? What are the drawbacks? How did you get it to work? Uh, where are we at from a, a holistic industry approach to pavement preservation? And how can we propel our practices forward? That's, that's what we want to get to uh, today. So we've, we've discussed the highlighted, um, we've, we've um, highlighted the innovations. Uh, the draft implementation plan uh, exists. Uh, you know, we've, we've gone through, we've outlined what the, what the innovations we think are for microsurfacing, new mixed design techniques. We've talked about uh, some of the innovative chip seal practices, including what Scott said, but also, you know, the innovative materials. Some folks are using a hot asphalt rubber applied binder for that aggregate to adhere to. Uh, I know in Washington State, they're experimenting with a hot applied uh, AC uh, 10 or, or 15 P to, to adhere that material down. So um, there's a lot of innovations out there that, that are available the question is, how is it best to spread that, spread that knowledge? What can we do to build uh, cultures within your agencies for how those, uh, so that we adopt the use of those, of those techniques? And so that's what I'd like your, your feedback on. So the question, do you construct quality pavement preservation treatments? If so, which treatments, what practices contribute to quality? What are the things, uh, uh, you know, the thing that struck me about Scott's presentation is uh, that there were some, it seems like at every advancement, there was a challenge that, that, ha that they had to overcome. That, oh, we had a problem with this, so we, we fixed that. Oh, this didn't work very well for us, so we, we changed this. Uh, we found that a single size washed aggregate worked best. That, that means that they had to, had to do some tweaking there. So, uh, you know, I loved getting a go by spec when I was writing a new warranty spec for an asphalt pavement or something like that. I love to see uh, that new stuff uh, come across my desk that I could plagiarize or borrow or quote or, uh, reference, uh, but, but to make it a, a practice of my own so that I didn't have to necessarily learn 
that particular lesson myself by the sea of my pants, uh, as my daddy says. Um, so will you share your practices? What are you, what are you finding out there that are the ways that you're getting the, the technology transferred? How are, you, how are you learning about better ways to do things? We've run um, and invited uh, all 36 counties in Oregon to a chip sale workshop that we ran. We're running our second one in three years uh, this month. Um, everybody's basically bringing what, what their practice have been shared. It's a full day workshop uh, that we put together and we write it up afterwards and send out the results. Um, the conditions are different from Southwest versus Southeast. <coughs> We've also done a um, a uh, large grouping of central and eastern Oregon counties where the conditions are totally different. Roads are totally different. Um, some of them have used some very large rock followed by some small rock and you can hear a truck coming from miles away but uh, the road holds up. <coughs> um, we've also done a uh, Washington, Oregon shared uh, county group discovering which uh, practices work, same with the, the snow plow issues and stuff. We've invited Pierce County and uh, Spokane, as well as three other counties in, in Oregon. And they've been very successful workshops. So, Okay, great. So the peer exchanges and workshops have worked well for you guys? Very much so, yes. Okay. Very good. Anyone else? I could share quite a few things, but just a a few that, that stand out to me that we've learned here recently is with our concrete repairs where we have to use the rapid set product, we actually had fairly poor success with those for quite a while. But we started calibrating the, the mobile uh, mixers and measuring air, make sure, making sure we had the right amount of air. And then also we put as many macrofibers in as we can. And so far we've been very happy with that. And it's, they've been down for about five years now. So that's, that's helped. It also helps that we've done CRCP pavement, so continuously reinforced concrete. It's turned out to be a great program for us. And around uh, some of the asphalt um, preventative maintenance treatments, some of the ones that were, were kind of at the cusp at, the bonded wearing, ultra bonded ultra thin wearing courses, we did a bonded thin wearing course. Um, for studded tire mitigation. So one inch thick with the bonded, and it was bonded with the spray paver. I think part of our challenge was, is usually where that technology is used, it's a gap graded mix, which doesn't do so well in our studded tire environment. So we did it with a dense grade, but there wasn't, there weren't many comparisons out there. So far we're happy with our product. We think it worked fine. And the, the micro surfacing fits into that same category in some ways. But there's a lot of art around that, so we're trying to work with our specifications to maybe get that a bit more consistent, too. Those will start to be better tools, hopefully, for us. So you, you're saying you have experience with microsurfacing on your state route system, or you're, you're gaining that experience? or We're gaining. We've only done one pilot. The counties around know, have done more with it than we okay. have here. But we, we may start using that more. That's, that's one of the treatments that I've heard uh, very rare use for in the, in the Northwest. Are there representatives here that, have, that feel like you have a good microsurfacing program? And what's, what's the uh, apprehension, I guess? Uh, what's, what's kept you from going that direction? Is it availability of contractors? Yes, ma'am. And we've been pleased with it so far. Um, we're using it mainly to fill ruts. Um, so you use a rut box pass and then do another, mm -hmm. like a 32 pound application so you get you get 10 or 11 pounds and then you get 22 pounds 
right with a scratch Sorry. surface and fill okay. the ruts and then a scratch surface and then the top lift okay great so, so one of the things that they I don't want to apply e construction to this but one of the things they do in e construction is develop state profiles as to best practices and I think that would be really helpful I mean sitting here listening to North Carolina and I was able to translate because I listened slowly but <laughs> but um, you know knowing about the Goldilocks zone so to speak and I know in Oregon we've had a lot of problems with um, chip seals in particular east side versus west side of the Cascades um, Marion County has taught us a lot and so has Benton County over here on the east or west side but having profile practices that would help us reinforce with our contract community what's worked in other areas. It might not be so much by, by geography as by weather conditions, whether it's high humidity or coastal, or if we were in Utah, high desert, or Montana, even high desert. So okay. if we could maybe take a lesson from there, that'd be helpful. Great. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, as we looked at challenges, uh, for implementation of, of these practices. We thought about, um, you know, is it difficult in, in a particular area to get the same quality materials as, as you might have? I, I would have had a hard time getting North Carolina granted in Tennessee. That would have been an exp expensive proposition. So I would have been asking, how do I get this to work with my limestone materials, my higher quality limestones? Uh, or my local limestones. What what are the what are the soundness values? What are the hardness values? That's I mean that's the kind of detail that I wanted to know as a specification writer. So um, are quality contractors bidding on your projects? How how do you make your projects your pilot projects, for instance, more attractive? How do you get multiple bidders? How do you um, how do you get the best qualified contractor to do the work. Um, um, so what what are other challenges that you see and that's one of the that's one of the form uh, questions that we have there that's that's part of the information that we like to extract is what are the challenges that you see to keeping your specifications in the state of the practice or state of the art um, keeping your folks trained, keeping, um, staying abreast of the, the current innovative materials. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Dirk Rogers, I'm a county guy from Northeast South Dakota. And as I mentioned earlier today, it's really flat and really swampy and we'd have no rock. I mean, w what we do have is usually marginalized with shale, uh, in terms for using it for gravel or, or, uh, or seal material. Now, we used to use granite. It's 80 miles away, and we can truck it in ourselves, but we end up about 35 bucks a ton. Now, that's not going to scare the crap out of everybody, but uh, we have some reasonable alternatives, and so we go with a really clean P-Rock, and, you know, some guys freak out, and there's not enough fracture in there for them. But, you know, we spend a lot of time. I don't want perfect to be the enemy of something that's serviceable and that we can use. And then we throw a fog seal on top of it using CSS uh, 1H. It's very inexpensive oil. <clears throat> uh, we don't have enough. Uh, our, our analysis or analytics on what we're doing is basically go drive around in the pickup and go, oh, hell, that worked good and that didn't, you know. But I know the DOT in Northeast South Dakota and maybe the Watertown guys could speak a little to it. Um, have gone to, they have a really hardcore modified P rock. So they put a lot of money into their aggregate again. And they put, uh, and they use the fog seals two, three days after. And they push stuff from a seven year cycle out to, to a 10 year cycle in some areas. So, kind of to answer your other question about, you know, I depend on the DOT a lot because we don't have the mechanism locally to do all that research other than what I said or having the farmers yell at you because you did one thing one way or not. So I rely on them a lot for that. And then as a side note, from what we can tell, you know, the angular of that, of that crushed granite, uh, the snow plows aren't near as hard on the P-Rock. Now, I'm sure there's other adverse things there, but our mm -hmm. chip retention is, has been really good because the plows aren't ripping off the angular rock either every winter. Great. 
Thank you for that. Other, other solutions or in, uh, ways that we can address your challenges? Um, adopting innovative uh, construction practice practices or improved construction practices. What are the um, information sources? We heard about the the uh, case studies for each state or a state profile. What other things would help you disseminate information within your area as a as a program manager? What what information would assist you, or what what tools? pieces of information would help you disseminate that. Is, uh, is web-based training or uh, e-learning, uh, workshops, uh, mentoring, peer exchanges, what are, the, what are the things that work for you within your agency? They're getting quiet on you, Greg. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Coffee break. Um, what help do you need? I mean, does there need to be a regular uh, blurb of here's the, here's the next new thing? We need Rhode Island to ride up their rubberized chip seal process. We need, uh, yes, sir. At least for me, it, some peer exchanges would be helpful. I just went through an exercise reaching out to the other states in the Northwest to ask about their chip seal best practices to see how well we aligned with it. And there's differences, but there's a few things that are similar too. But some of the newer technologies, microsurfacing, again, ultra thin bonded wearing courses, a working group maybe focusing more on those would be very useful to me at least. Well, how about the full depth concrete repair and Partial depth repair, are you? Uh, Not for me, anyhow. I only speak okay. for Oregon. All right. Yeah. Very good. Greg, I think one of the other forms that's available, too, is the uh, regional partnerships that meet. Rocky Mountain West, for example, here, once a year, and uh, peer exchange goes on regularly at those meetings. Okay. Very effective. I agree. Very productive. So what helps your organization accelerate change in general? Who are the stakeholders that we need to address within your organization? And what are the tools that as a program manager you would use? And that's, that's another one of those uh, fill in the blank kind of questions that I'd, I'd like for you to leave some information for me on. How do we, how do we address, how do we reach your specification writer? How do we reach uh, your district inspectors, your, your construction crew inspectors and your uh, preservation engineers? What are, the, what are the forums and the tools that we use to, to get the innovations in their hands? Yeah, I know uh, Scott in his presentation talked about information that they had on their website. And I think being able to uh, maybe have a clearinghouse of a lot of that information, the, the National Center for Pavement Preservation, you know, they have a website that includes information about uh, uh, provisional specifications. So, so people can go to that website if they want ideas about how to write specs and see examples from other states so um, maybe that just needs to be um, emphasized or, or um, publicized and, and better communicated so that there's a because we we learn a lot from everybody's successes and everybody's failures and being able to have a forum for sharing that information that's easy to get to um, I know it's difficult because when you make mistakes, you're not 
the first thing you do isn't the, is maybe to sit down and, and write a note to yourself, but you don't necessarily publish it to everybody, but that would be useful to be able to, to share that information. Okay. Thank you, Dave. <coughs> and how do we track progress? Once states make a change, how do we how do we how do we know we've improved our specifications? What are the what are the things that happen for you that uh, tell you you've done the right change with your with your spec? I mean, it's more of that pickup truck going, "Wow, this worked," and that didn't. Uh, how do you promulgate that across your your agency? Well, again, if you have ideas, uh, we need to begin wrapping up. Uh, please make notes on that on that sheet and leave with us. We're interested in who the stakeholders are in your agency, who we need to reach, uh, what in particular. I know the, the regional partnerships, uh, each state sends two uh, participants. Are those the right people? Is that the right number? Uh, how, how can this get integrated into your, into your agency? That's the, that's the question. How can we accelerate change in the adoption of these innovations? Um, so again, uh, if you've signed in, we have your contact information. You'll be receiving an updated participant workbook at the end of all seven summits. Uh, you'll be included in the community of Pavement Preservation How folks. So feel free to stay current in, in what's happening. We'll be sending you that electronic participant workbook. Uh, you'll have the links to the information as we uh, develop the implementation plan. And certainly, as Jane said, in the next two years, as the products roll out and the uh, implementation for this effort takes place, uh, you guys will be involved. So uh, we appreciate your time and your input here. Staying with us, staying engaged. Uh, let's thank our speakers again.